it's interesting having lived in Plano for so many years, having so many years under my experience uh, of experience, I can pretty much assure any citizen that calls me if they have a problem, I've either seen it or lived it before. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Stoller. And I'm Shauna Haley, and this is Inside Plano. Steve Stoller. Hi, Shauna. Well, you know what? We blinked and summer is over. I can't believe it. Um, although the temperatures don't seem to believe that summer is over. I, I know I'm sitting here for those who are watching this on video. I'm sitting here in a sweater and we'll explain that, <laughs> that a little bit later because it's cold in the room we're in. But school's in session and summer just flew by. What was your favorite part of the summer? My favorite part of the summer is always enjoying the outdoors and, you know, going in the swimming pool and just relaxing. Oh, you know, I, I like that as well. And I feel like I spent more than my fair share of time outside this summer. My favorite part was related to that. It was celebrating the city's 150th anniversary. We did that not once, but twice this summer. We had the big community birthday celebration in Haggard Park. And then we celebrated again a month and a day later at um, Plano's All-American 4th. And I think between those two events, we must have said hello and handed out cupcakes and cookies and birthday presents to 8,000 people that stopped by our tents. And that was just a fabulous, fun Those experience. Those great little pins. Yes, yes. And yeah. our special guest today is wearing one as well. And, you know, related to that, by the way, um, those kids are all back in school um, and school is definitely underway. We've got school zones. Please slow down <laughs> as you're driving to work. And um, it's time to build in a little extra commute time as we want to keep those students safe. And, you know, speaking of commutes, this is a perfect time to talk mm -hmm. about commuting across Plano. And you may wonder where we are today. We're actually in our traffic management center to talk about traffic and commutes. And with us is Brian Shusky, who's our transportation engineering manager. I got your title right. Yes, good welcome, to be here. Welcome, Brian. And welcome back, we should yeah. say. You were with us our first season, and now we're in our sixth season of Inside Plano. And you know, we always ask the first question to tell us something about yourself that we don't know. Well, let's just start off with my wife and I have been residents of Plano since 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, we've raised three kids in, in that time, time frame. And um, I've been a practicing traffic engineer for 37 years now uh, and hope to make it probably another five or 10 years. We'll, we'll see if they haven't fired me yet. Maybe they won't. <laughs> uh, but as a side note, you know, it's, it's your sixth season. I was part of the first season. I had been here a whole six months Exactly. Uh, when we started. Uh, so, um, but it's interesting having lived in Plano for so many years, having so many years under my experience uh, of, of experience, I can pretty much assure any citizen that calls me if they have a problem, I've either seen it or lived it before. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy about that. Uh, but 2018 was actually supposed to be the year I was gonna retire after 33 years in the profession. Uh, but the city of Plano presented me with an opportunity uh, to come here and I literally could not pass up the opportunity. Uh, basically to make a transformative change in, in tra transportation uh, in Plano. So many times I wanted to get my hands on something that, you know to fix it and now i now i was afforded that opportunity but we started with in the, when i started we started with four goals one is to improve um, uh, safety the second one was to improve traffic flow the next one was to improve efficiencies and finally just to be a good steward of, of public funds well we're glad you're here mm -hmm. and let's talk about a lot's happened in the last five years and especially to the space that we're sitting in Tell us a little bit about the Traffic Management Center. So the Traffic Management Center, also known as the, the, the TMC, this is our new Traffic Management Center. Um, it is three times as large as our previous Traffic Management Center and a thousand times more uh, functional than our Traffic Management Center that was built in the mid 90s. We literally just moved, well, we moved into here and we've been building it uh, for the last year and a half. And just last month, we finished the last tweaks of, of uh, finalizing the traffic management center. And hopefully, you know, you'll see a big shot of, at some point, of the entire center. 
So tell us, I, I was joking about the sweater, but that's because there's this huge bank of computers behind me. So obviously this room has to be kept at a cooler temperature to protect those. But what is the benefit of having a traffic management center? I mean, the signals are all out in the field. So why do we need this? Well, the, the TMC is the heart and lifeblood of everything that we do in, in traffic management. Literally everything comes through through here unless we we have to be out in the field. Uh, you mentioned the computer banks that are sitting behind you. These are actually controller cabinets, the ones that we have out in the field. But we have three different types of controller cabinets that, that we're evaluating. We also use these to test our new timing plans before we put them in the intersection. So we know that they, they work before they, they actually get there. The, the big machine that's over here behind you, which is why, why you need the uh, uh, things, we actually have our own uh, HVAC system in here. Because of all the equipment, we need to keep it a little cooler. Mm -hmm. So actually about five or seven degrees cooler than every, everywhere else. Well, uh, during this hot summer, that's not a bad thing, you know, come in and get a respite in here. But, 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 but you did, you asked about the benefit. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you two quick, quick benefits. Generally, we remotely can see out into the field, out to our signalized intersections. That's a benefit in itself. Previously, uh, what we had to do is if we had a problem in an intersection, we had to physically get in the car, go out to the intersection and see what was, see what was happening. That took a lot of staff time, literally hundreds and hundreds of hours per year just doing that. Uh, one benefit of one of the new systems that we installed, the school zone flasher system, uh, we have 178 of those uh, out in the field. You mentioned school zone flashers mm -hmm. earlier. We literally, up until about four or three years ago, we had to go in the field three or four, three or four times per year and check the clocks to make sure that they were synchronized and then change the, the start and end times uh, for PISD and FISD. With the new system that we installed uh, three, three years ago, we're able to remotely see that from the Traffic Management Center. I know I didn't, you know, send you this question in advance, but like just that that time saving. So about how long did it take to visit one flasher and do that test and change the oh, thing? It's, it's, it's about an hour to, to so go through an that, hour that whole break. At, at it's each from, one. From, it's actually Public Works is doing this. Yeah. Their staff leaving Public Works office to get, go to the flasher and then come back. Round trip's about an hour. So wow. we're, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of hours of savings. Wow. Well, in addition to being able to kind of remotely launch these um, signal timing changes and things. What What's one other really neat thing that you can do now that you have the TMC in place and fully functional that you, that you just couldn't do before the expansion and renovation? Well, I mentioned the one, the, the, the school zone flasher systems, uh, just our signal timing plans. Uh, we're able to, able to actually upload and download from this location uh, to our signalized intersections. So that's a, 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 a big savings. Oh. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've, we, we talked about, or, or started talking about, and I forgot to, to mention it, we, we actually have a, an overall plan that we started with, uh, a blueprint, as, as you might say, which is updated, you know, on a, a yearly basis. And this plan is here on the wall over my, my left shoulder. Mm -hmm. And generally in, in, in the plan, we have the traffic management center as the, the the core of the overall traffic management system. And then we have subsystems uh, off of it. Uh, we, are, we are currently uh, expanding our CCTV camera system uh, from about uh, 44 locations uh, to over 200 locations. Uh, we are uh, expanding and changing out our, uh, our, our wireless communication system to fiber optic communications. Uh, we are uh, updating our traffic signal cabinets, our traffic signal controllers, uh, which are 20 years old. So think in terms of computers and what your computer used to look like 20 years ago compared to today. That's the kind of change that we're, we're anticipating uh, in, on the technology side uh, once we implement that. While we're on the topic of traffic signals, you've been working on a signal communications program the last few years. What exactly is that? Why is it needed? So uh, one of the things that, that we're changing out, you know, we're, whereas the traffic management center itself is the, the heart and the lifeblood of the system, the actual the arteries of the system, 
the communications is is uh, was uh, wireless communications, uh, which we're changing out to fiber optic communications. We've already had three phases, where about approximately 45 percent of our signalized intersections, which I should mention is uh, is 282 intersections. Uh, is, uh, we've 45 percent of those have been changed over to fiber optic communications at this point, and we. We have a fourth phase that we're designing right now to change out most of the remaining uh, intersections to, 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 to fiber. What's important about that is it allows us to bring more video back across the, the, our communication system back to the TMC. Uh, wireless simply will not handle that. Another big benefit of changing to fiber is we now don't have to pay these huge monthly cellular telephone bills or cellular uh, modem bills that we have to pay right now. Uh, I think the total amount for, for 2022 was uh, close, or actually over $100,000 is what we had to pay. That gets eliminated with, with, with fiber. And then the last thing I want to just say about fiber is every new traffic management system that somebody can dream up, we should be able to utilize the capacity of the fiber optic communications to handle that, whether it be autonomous vehicles or j anything, you know, Star Wars that you can think of, mm -hmm. we can we can handle that with fiber. So that becomes our foundation. Brian, I do a lot of driving across the city, coming to and from work and going out and about. And it seems like sometimes I hit every red light. <laughs> sometimes it seems like I hit every green light. How? What is the challenge of trying to synchronize traffic signals to improve traffic flow? Well. We actually have three timing plans that we generally use, AM, a, an off-peak, and then a, and a PM plan. Uh, we're in the process of, of updating. Uh, we actually were gonna update the AM and, and PM back in 2020, and then COVID hit, and we had no traffic to synchronize. Mm -hmm. uh, the traffic volumes literally disappeared. Um, but um, what we're doing right now is we're starting up that process again, where we're gonna update uh, develop, implement, and fine-tune new coordination timing plans for AM and PM peak. We've already done the midday, um, so over the next year, year and a half, we'll be doing the AM and the PM. But to answer your question directly, if you have a situation, if you live in Plano and you have a situation where you're driving through Plano and you have two or three or four or five intersections that you typically hit green on a given day, and then all of a sudden, you don't hit green, um, maybe one or two or maybe more of them. And that's very unusual because you typically hit, hit green. It's usually one of two things. It's one of our detectors has, has failed us. The, one of our 20 year old detectors has failed us. Uh, or more likely, it's one of our emergency vehicle preemptions that occurs. We roughly have about 5,000 of these, uh, I'm sorry, 17 to 20,000 of these per month. Uh, Per month? Per month. <laughs> and what I want to say, but I said five, it's, it's 5,000 per week, but 17 to 20 per month. And what happens is every time an emergency vehicle preemption occurs, we lose coordination for six to eight minutes. It's just the way that, that all the systems work. And that's the frustration that, that we have. And we get lots of complaints. Well, I normally get a green and all of a sudden it was red. Well. We look up in the system, which we can do remotely here from the traffic management center, that there was an emergency vehicle preemption that occurred three minutes earlier before they got there. Hmm. So just for you know, people who may be listening to the podcast, an emergency vehicle preemption is ambulances making a run and right. they can... It's, it, for emergency vehicles, it's ambulances and it's um, the, the fire trucks. And it's not just Plano. We've, we've partnered up with... with um, uh, Wiley and Allen and Richardson and um, Carrollton and Frisco, and they actually have our codes. When we updated the system a couple of years ago, uh, we actually actually put in a system that had codes. So these other other emergency vehicles have our codes or have their own separate codes. So we know exactly which vehicle is going through the system at any given time. Prior to that. Literally, somebody could go on the internet and buy a device and to preempt the signals. And once we implemented the new system, uh, I think it was 18% of the preempts disappeared. Wow. Shocking. 
<laughs> it's shocking. So tell us, you, you talked about being able to test timing plans, you know, on the system here. So how challenging is it? You, you mentioned there are three timing plans. So how challenging is it to do an adjustment, set it up and implement? So uh, over here, Leah, raise your hand. <laughs> Hi, you've, got, Leah. you've got Leah over here. She's one of our, our uh, traffic uh, operations uh, specialists. And Larry, is Larry over there? Larry, raise your hand. He's, he's another one. Um, uh, Matt or I or one of a, a handful of others will just call in and say, hey, we need to make an offset change. And that takes all of five minutes because wow. we can be in, the, be in the field. We can call it in and make the change. But if it's a new timing plan, completely new from scratch, uh, we're, we're talking a couple hours uh, to do that um, just for one, one timing plan. If we're talking about a coordinated timing plan, mm -hmm. such as the AM peak, we're talking several thousand hours of effort to develop those timing plans, well, collect the data, develop the timing plans, implement, and then fine tune them. So it goes from very small for one intersection to the whole, the whole system. Uh, it gets a lot more complicated. And I'm assuming testing, it's, it's like running in simulation. So it's like, well, what? We, we what? test it ahead of time in simulation. Okay. But the fine tuning is you actually get in the, your car and you're driving the system. And based on what we see in our simulation, we know that okay, you're going to get a green, 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 green. And we, are, we have a four stop at this particular location just because you have four different directions that, that you're having to accommodate from a coordination standpoint. And so sometimes we force a particular stop. So we know what's supposed to happen. And then based on the drive that we go through, uh, we make little tweaks in, in, in our timing plans. Interesting. Well, I, I told Steve, I'm like fascinated by the camera views that we can see over your shoulder on, on the big screen. So it, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong and, and hopefully I am wrong. It, it, it just feels like there's a lot more traffic on our roads. Is there or is there not? Well, if your baseline is March, April, or May of 2020, there's a ton more traffic on the roads. So let me get, so pre-pandemic, pre post-pandemic, <laughs> do we have more cars? It's almost exactly the same. Okay, so so the only change really was pandemic, but we haven't seen an increase in volume well, the outside volumes, of that. Well, the volumes have, have, have increased. The freeways have actually gotten heavier. Um, and the distribution of traffic throughout the day has changed. Our AM peak period uh, is a little less and not as long. Um, our midday is actually significantly higher than it used to be. I think 15 to 20% higher because more people are, are telecommuting or people are going out to lunch because they're telecommuting, they're running errands during the day. So our midday is actually higher and then our PM peak is actually lower. In the areas where we've seen more traffic, is that pass-through traffic, cars cars and trucks coming through Plano, or is it directly within the city limits? Well, I actually made a presentation to city council about that. Uh, one aspect of the presentation was about pass-through traffic. We actually did an OD study in early 2022, if you may or may not recall that. And one of the things we wanted to address is the specific question of how much traffic is actually pass-through traffic. And the study actually looked at all the arterials, north-south arterials, all the east-west arterials, the freeways. Now, if you look at the freeways, yes, the majority of the traffic on the freeways is pass-through. That's to be expected. But if you look at Preston Road, for instance, as just one example, Preston Road, the daily pass-through traffic, if you're going southbound on Preston Road at State Highway 121 and you're, you're wanting to go all the way to PBGT, all the way through town, it's only 11% of the traffic is passed through. So there is some traffic, but it's not like it's half or more of the traffic, which has been contended for many, many years by many people. Brian, I know you're always looking for new and innov innovative ways to move people around Plano. Uh, back a few months ago, we heard about gondolas. <laughs> uh, the news media did a few stories on it. Where are we at with that? Is that a is that a real possibility that someday we may have gondolas well, moving people not, around town? Someday, but not anytime anytime soon. So what we actually did is North Central Texas Council of Governments, I'll just call it COG for short, they actually had a program to allow these companies to come in. They vetted those companies to allow cities or other agencies to submit applications 
to begin discussions with these companies. We submitted application for JPOD and for Swift Cities, two primary uh, uh, companies in this particular space, aerial people mover systems. And um, we've been in discussions with, with, with both companies, but the next step is to actually do a feasibility study, which we've gotten a $375,000 grant from COG uh, to do this feasibility study. And it's gonna look at a lot of things. What, what kind of space do we need? What kind of demand do we think there's gonna be? Do we have buy-in from the businesses? And we're looking specifically at the, the, the legacy business area, which is bounded by 121 Spring Creek and, and Preston, and doing something in that area. Uh, legacy West, Legacy Town Center, all the corporate campuses out there. If everybody says we don't want it, then it's dead in the water to start with. Gotcha, so really the discussion is more about feasibility analysis and having permission to do it rather than this is what we want to do. We're Correct. just looking. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, from new school to old school, old school is speed bump, right? You know, speed and my neighborhood has a ton of speed bumps because we have a major pass through road. I know um, we hear from residents who are asking about speed bumps in alleys different different philosophies at different points in time um, from traffic management and from PD on whether we're going to have speed bumps. So do we install new speed bumps? And if we do, how can neighborhoods begin a discussion about whether a speed bump is appropriate? And if we do not, why not? Well, I will try not to confuse everybody because I'm going to give you two answers. Okay. That are completely opposite from each other. <laughs> Since 2010, Prior to 2010, we actually had a speed speed hump program where we put speed humps on roadways in residential areas. I, whether it's successful or not, I don't know. There's still a lot that are out there that, that, that we maintain. But conversely, there were a lot that we installed that citizens after a month of use decided they didn't like it because of the noise, because it hurt their car, um, because they couldn't drive faster. There was lots of reasons that they, they, were, they were removed. Um, we also have, uh, and, and so right now, right now, we do not have that program. However, in the, I think it's the 2021 bond program, uh, the citizens saw fit to approve the transportation package of which we had $400,000 for traffic calming, which includes speed humps and other measures that reduce speeds on uh, residential roadways or traffic volumes on residential roadways. I won't get into the, we don't have time to go into all the different details, but what we've done is we've added that into our new, almost adopted, it hasn't adopted, it's going to uh, PNZ for approval on the 21st of August, and then it'll be going to council soon after uh, our third first standards update. Uh, but once that's installed, uh, once that's approved, then we can restart our program for speed humps and other other measures. Now, I do have to say that based on previous requests for such items, it is going to be a very competitive process. W we have a finite amount of money. We have a huge demand for wanting to put these in, and there's a process that we will be going through uh, to get the highest need uh, needs taken care of first. We've always had and continues to still have an alley speed hunt program, uh, which 70% of the, the residents on the alley have to approve it. Uh, they have to pay for it. I think it's $250, but the city will maintain it uh, to for perpetuity uh, once they're once they're installed. Interesting. I don't think I knew that there was actually an alleyway hump program. That's fascinating. So. It, you know, speaking of that, there are a lot of things that your team does at the request or the initiation of residents. Uh, and that may be, you know, exploring, right? It, not necessarily functionally doing, but looking into. So everything from, you know, I think there should be a stop sign here, or I think there should be a new signal at, at this intersection. Can you talk a little bit about that process of residents reaching out and, and what traffic engineering itself does um, in partnership with our community? Well, there's actually 26 different kinds of traffic studies that, that we do. Wow. Not necessarily every year, but there's 26 different kinds. You've mentioned three or four of them already. 
the best way in to get in touch with us is through Plano's Fix-It system, F-I-X-I-T. Just uh, search for Fix-It Plano. There's an online app that allows you to submit a request, whether it's traffic related or, or enforcement related or potholes or roadway or construction. It's a great app. There's, mm -hmm. It's a fantastic app. We actually get close to 800 requests, just traffic alone, requests every year. Uh, that, that we address, and we address every single one of them. We get a, a large number of stop sign requests. There's a process that we go through, an engineering systems process, or just an engineering process, where we look at the traffic volumes, we look at the, the site distance, and we look at accidents. And if it meets a certain threshold, then, then we'll install it. Um, just because you request one doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have one. Uh, having been in Plano for 30 years, I can say there's many stop signs in my neighborhood that are absolutely not necessary and nobody pays attention to them, which is the big, big problem with putting too many stop signs in. Nobody pays attention to them. They just, just run right through them. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's see, you mentioned, um, it, so the, the best way to do it is, is through, through the fix it system. Fabulous. Let's talk about North Central Expressway, US 75. <laughs> Gosh, for years and years and years, they expanded it as traffic came through. It's one of the busiest corridors in North Texas, obviously. But what can be done to help traffic move on 75? Does Texdon have any plans? Yes and yes. <laughs> so uh, the immediate plans are the uh, technology lanes uh, project or the HOV conversion project. So right now we have two HOV lanes that, that are going through, through the system. What TxDOT is planning to do from basically 635 all the way up to State Highway 121 is to come in and put um, and change out these HOV lanes to technology lanes. So instead of the, the bollards that you see that you can't cross, it'll be barrier free, but it will have technology in place such as cameras that will look and see how many passengers you have in your car and it will charge you a fee only during the AM peak period for southbound and only during the PM peak for, for northbound. And I think it's a, a one and a half hour, maybe two hour time period. Every time, other time during the day, it's free. So it'll be a free lane except for directional in a certain time of, of the day. And it might be one hour, but it, it's either one, or, one, or, one to two hours of, of time. So that's one of the things that's gonna help in, improve. Uh, TxDOT is also studying just in, well, I think they might have expanded the study, but we submitted a request for 26 different improvements on uh, US-75. Ramp reversals, ramp changes, uh, expansions of the, the, the frontage road systems, uh, lots of improvements. That was literally in the, the first six months I was here. I remember that list of things that I had that I wanted to get my hands on? I basically already had the list prepared, handed it to them. That they've actually studied it, they've expanded it, and they are looking at short-term and possible long-term improvements. Uh, long-term being maybe lowering the freeway, something similar to what they did down in Dallas, where the freeway is lowered into a canyon. This is one example, but uh, they're, they're looking long-term and then short-term improvements, such as the ones we submitted for them. So we have a lot of traffic, a lot of road construction around town, like we always do and road construction impedes the flow of traffic. I want you to look back in the, the five years you've been here <coughs> in the city of Plano. Five and a half. Five and a half. Has traffic management improved from the time you came to now? Absolutely. I mean, it, before we, we, we didn't even know what was going on. Now we have a program in place where we can actually see at the intersections what's happening. We, with the cameras that, that we do have in place, and we still have a lot of holes, but the cameras we do have in place, we can see a quarter of a mile up and down the roadways, so we can see what's happening with with the with the road systems. We have uh, the fix-it system that people uh, refer to, uh, work zone issues. Um, all the inspectors, uh, the folks over in Public Works, they know to contact us if they see see an issue. Uh, and then just driving around town, I drive around town a lot. I, I live here. I see things. And then we, we know who to call to, to get something fixed. It's if there's a barrel out of place um, or if the signs are missing, um, 
one of a myriad of, of things that, that might be happening, we can, we can take care of it and fix it. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast today. It's really interesting to see, you know, all the things that happen behind our daily drives across Plano. And we take so much for granted. And it's just so great to see what the city of Plano is doing to try and help commuters and drivers get from one place to another a lot easier and faster. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the message of today's podcast really is that, you know, besides slow down for construction and, and school zones, Plano is working to make traffic better. There's always going to be traffic. Traffic is part of living in, in an area with lots of other people, but managing it, increasing efficiency, um, Plano is working on that. And for those of you who are only listening to the audio, this graphic that we've referred to, you know, we'll we'll include it in the show notes because I think it's really interesting. The Traffic Management Center is is shown as kind of a hub and there are eight different components that impact that and all of them <laughs> have work going on. You know, two are recently um, upgraded, but two are being expanded. Four are in the process of being ex uh, upgraded right now. So a lot of work. Improvements take time. Brian mentioned, you know, he walked in, you know, five years ago with a long list, you know, four, four simple priorities, but simple priorities still take a lot of time. And when we've been talking, we've talked to Dan um, over in Public Works, to Caleb, it, engineering as a whole, the city is doing a lot. Road repairs, then putting asphalt overlays to maintain that repair and extend the lifetime um, use of that project signal retiming, but relying on better fiber. And so getting the fiber into all of the signals, retiming those signals, um, improving what we're doing in terms of management and testing, increasing efficiency. That's a multi-layered approach. It's gonna take time, but the end result is very positive. So we need to, we need to be a little patient through the process, but also rely on fix it Plano to let people know because it's impossible, right, so Brian? We said multi-layered. One of the things we didn't touch on that's really important is the capacity uh, in moving, actually, the traffic flow. Mm -hmm. We started a program, actually it had already been started, but we've expanded on intersection improvements. Yep. Our goal, every major, major intersection, arterial intersection that we have, our goal is to have dual lefts in a right turn lane on, on every approach. And we are actually doing that and probably have 25 now that we've we've done we probably still have another 45 or 55 i think to go but we have plans in place to try to update all of these and just from an operational standpoint you know if you have a, a dual left you as a driver if you're listening to this you as a driver know as you drive through plano during the am or pm peak and you come up on an intersection and the left turn is backed up into the through lane we now no longer have a through lane. We have two through lanes instead of three Correct. because that left turn lane is backed up. Putting dual left turn lanes or extending the length of the left turn lane allows us to actually store more vehicles so we can have the full three lanes. So that has significantly improved traffic flow at some of these intersections that we've already touched. You know, Absolutely. I just want to say one thing in closing. Yeah. A lot of people see road construction and I know it's a headache and it may take a little more time, but they never seem to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. What they don't seem to grasp is that all these improvements that are being made across the city are really going to improve their, their commute and getting from one place easier. Well, so keep in mind, folks, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's really all for the benefit of transportation. Absolutely. And, and I'll, you know, as I'm wrapping up, I'll Oh, this is a good point. Like you've lived in Plano a long time. You've lived in Plano a long time. I have as well. We moved here in 2000. I've always lived kind of in the same portion of the city. I remember when um, Custer Road and Spring Creek intersection, boy, that was a crazy designed intersection because at one point in time, the plan was to maybe have elevated roads, right? Uh, and so that entire intersection was redone and that was a very extensive project. It took forever. And now I can barely remember how dysfunctional that intersection was because it's highly functional. Same thing with Coit and Spring Creek. Dysfunctional, now highly functional. Traffic flows very well through that intersection. Now there are times that there are hiccups because the light gets preempted and whatnot. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but the problem is we forget. And once we experience the new, it's easy to forget what the old was. So we've Sorry, already. I, I have to up you one. one. 
I remember when Preston and State Highway 121 were two two lane roadways intersecting. I remember that as well. <laughs> I do too. Uh, I always tell people when my husband and I moved overseas, we were gone for two and a half years and we came back and Sam Rayburn Tollway was built in that two years. And that was a mind blowing experience to come back from a, what used to be a four lane road to this elevated toll road. But anyway, so stay patient Plano. <laughs> and thank you for joining us for this extensive conversation about um, traffic management. And I think we're gonna be doing more of this type of conversation in the podcast because really, a lot of work is happening and it's hard to see it because it's happening behind the scenes. So we want to keep you updated as these things progress. Um, if you have any questions or you feel like you didn't get enough detail, you know you can email us at askplano at plano.gov. Um, submit those traffic requests through Fix It Plano. And until next time, we'll be talking to you. Thanks, Shauna. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. And that's it for our Inside Plano. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did doing it. If you have any comments or suggestions, send them to us at askplano at plano.gov. Bye. Talk to you next month. The Inside Plano podcast is brought to you by the City of Plano.